This is your daily scripture for October 17th. My name is Henry Loke, and this is God's Feeding Station. And it is an honor and a blessing to be with you again today as we continue in the book of John, John chapter 4. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman from Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will teach us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Just then, His disciples came back. They marveled that He was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. 
After the two days, he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. It's an interesting conversation that Jesus has with this woman. He just met a Samaritan woman who if the Pharisees were around, would just give them one more thing to gripe about and condemn Jesus for. And we all know the history with the Samaritans and the Jews. We've talked about that at length here. So Jesus engages in this discussion and he begins to break down these walls of wrong belief that this woman has. The fact that he's just talking to her should should tell her, should reveal to her, excuse me, that these old rivalries, these old hatreds, this kind of Matfield and McCoy thing is is done with. Right? These these um these old uh, I don't know, like the old merits of Mount Gerizim and Mount Zion are going to be irrelevant. Because God will be found anywhere he is looked for. Israel still has a unique place in God's plan. But it will no longer be relevant or important to go to the temple to worship. And as a result, the, 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 the Samaritans are stuck. Right, This woman shows us that they're stuck and a little bit of ignorance here. The Samaritans only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament. They didn't read the prophets. They didn't read Psalms. They didn't read Proverbs. All they, all they had was this truncated Bible. And so they had a very limited faith because they limited themselves to just those five books. Jewish rabbis used to charge the Samaritans that they were superstitious in how they worshipped. And there was this common belief that the Samaritans' faith was based on ignorance and fear, not love and knowledge. And if you go back and read Second Kings, you'll see, 17, you'll see that a lot of foreign people were brought into Samaria. And so with them came their foreign gods. And so you had this kind of mixing thing of, of all these different religions. And as a result, what was going on in Samaria was this false worship. And it's false because it's selective. Again, they only had the first five books of the Bible. Right? So they chose to believe about God what what satis- what satisfied them and and disregarded the rest they paid like i said paid no attention to anything outside of the first five books and we've seen how people will take the bible and justify unjustifiable things slavery 
apartheid, the Holocaust, whatever, you know, men can bend the word of God to make it suit their needs and have done so and will continue to do so. That's false. That's a lie. And it needs to be seen as such. Uh, false worship is ignorant. Um, we all have minds. We all have brains. We're to exercise those minds. We're to be Bereans and search the scriptures. E.F. Scott said that religion is far more than merely the strenuous exercise of the intellect, but that nonetheless a very great part of religious failure is due to nothing other than intellectual sloth, right? Just believing whatever a pastor says without doing the due diligence to make sure he's telling the truth. The other thing that the Samaritans had was superstitions. They would practice faith simply because they thought it would be dangerous not to. Because again, that's a religion based on fear, not on love. Certainly not on gratitude for what God has done. So Jesus points out the fallacies here. And he says, look, God is spirit. And if God is spirit, he's not confined to anything. And if that's the case, then idol worship is just that. It's not real. Well, idol worship is real. The idol you're worshiping is not real. And it insults God when you try to confine him to something, a statue, a picture, whatever, anything man-made. He's not confined to spaces. There's no limit to where you can worship God. If your heart is in the right spot, you can worship him anywhere. And if God is spirit, then the gifts that man gives God must also be gifts of the spirit. And those are love, loyalty, obedience, devotion, things like that. And it has to be worship, worshiping in the spirit because that is what hangs around after the physical is gone. And so when we in the spirit attain gain friendship with God, intimacy with God, that is when worship really begins, genuine worship. It's not confined to a place. It's not confined to a ritual. It's not confined to what you donate or what you don't donate. True worship is having a relationship with God, speaking with him, meeting with him, obeying him, submitting to him. That's worship, and that's the point Jesus makes today. Don't get stuck. Don't get bogged down by rituals and, and things that churches tell you you have to do. God is spirit and must be worshiped in spirit. Have a great rest of your day, Lord willing. We'll talk again tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.